the many worlds are ever ready in interpretation of quantum mechanics is a theory that seeks to save realism and offer an explanation of quantum mechanics without the need to bring in the observer, like it is in idealistic interpretations. In other words, it basically tries to save the belief that there is an independent reality that is not dependent on the observer, and argue we are just passive observers and not actively involved. I have explained elsewhere the philosophical implications of standard quantum theory. The observer is necessary to play a fundamental role and collapse the wave function, but the many worlds interpretation tries to challenge this by arguing there is no collapse, and instead, every possibility just splits off into different branches. And when we think we are collapsing the wave function, in reality, we are just finding out what branch we are in. And in all other branches, there is an identical me thinking he has collapsed the wave function. Michael Clive Price says this would mean the observer plays no special role in the theory, and consequently, there is no collapse of the wave function. So in other words, the wave function really doesn't collapse to one state. Instead, it is several different worlds, and every possibility actually happens, hence why it is called the many worlds interpretation. Now it sounds interesting, but after several decades, there has been no well-defined, agreed way to explain this, and there is a large amount of internal disagreements on how the details of this work. But despite this, there are difficult problems for the many worlds interpretation, which I wish to highlight here and show why it is an incomplete description and doesn't compete with idealistic interpretations like quantum information theory and the orthodox interpretation. The first problem I wish to highlight is the problem of observers. The many worlds interpretation wishes to remove the fact that the observer plays a role, but recent experimental confirmations have created difficulties for this. Something I've highlighted often because of the radical implications is the experimental confirmation of the coach inspector theorem in 2011. This, among other experiments, demonstrates what we obtain as an outcome in an experiment depends on what we initially put in. It basically shows when we perform an experiment, the result is dependent on the experimental context or the choices of the observer. So as they simplified it in the New Scientist magazine, the values you obtain when you measure its properties depend on the context. So the value of property A, say, depends on whether you chose to measure it with property B or with property C. In other words, there is no reality independent of choice of measurement. Rosenblum and Kuttner point out in the basic double slit experiment, we select what part of nature to probe and therefore choose one set of possibilities over another. If this is the case, then it is hard to deny that reality acts independent of our choices if we are necessary to probe a part of nature. And the coach inspector theorem shows non-contextual theories are incompatible with quantum mechanics, meaning the outcome directly depends on the experimental context of what the observer puts in. Thus, the many worlds interpretation needs to include the observer's choice as an actual deterministic cause of the system. And this would collapse to the many minds interpretation, which is a theory that many worlds are splitting in the mind of a sentient being. So basically there are not many worlds, and I just happen to find myself in one, but there are many states of me in all observers. And in each, I am making different choices, and every choice I could make splits off. Now the large majority of many worlders wish to avoid this, as Adrian Kent, the leading critic of the many worlds interpretation explains, essentially everyone, including Albert and Lower, the creators of the many minds theory, agrees that the many minds interpretation, while logically consistent and in accord with the data, is utterly unsatisfactory, since it adds to the Everettian formalism a collection of ad hoc postulates, which not only are, even by Everettian standards, fantastic, but also undercuts the motivation for taking Everett seriously, namely that it purports to explain how to make sense of quantum theory without adding extra equations or interpretational postulates. I've gone into more detail about the need for the observer elsewhere, so I don't want to spend too much time on it here. The next is the problem of deriving the Born rule. This means when we study nature, we can derive the probability of each possibility we could end up with. This is the Born rule. To calculate the probability of what the different possibilities will be and the likelihood of each becoming the actual outcome. So for example, take the radioactive decay of a particle. Due to the probabilistic nature of the decay, we cannot know with certainty when it will decay. We can only know the probability. So for example, after the first hour, if we were to check, we could say the probability of decay is 50% and 50% that it did not decay. If we look after two hours, the probability of decay is 75%, and so on and so on. 
Now this creates a problem for the many worlds interpretation. Because what does it mean to say that one is more probable than the other, if both possibilities are supposed to split into different worlds and be equally real? Take Schrodinger's cat for example. If the cat is in a box with the radioactive decay in a vial of poison, and we have not yet looked, then according to standard quantum theory, the cat is both dead and alive in a mathematical superposition until we observe. But according to the many worlds interpretation, both possibilities have split, and when we look, we were just checking to see which world we have ended up in. But there is a problem with this, because the probability of decay changes over time, and it is never just 50-50. So if both worlds are equally real, how can we say that after one hour, it is more probable that we are in the world where the cat is alive? But if we wait four hours to look, then it is more probable that we are in the universe where the cat is dead. If both are equally real, and not affected by the observer's choice, then why is it that the probability is different depending on when we look? Henry Stapp explains it like this. The problem is to understand how a relative probability comes to be associated with each of the alternative possibilities, all of which occur jointly and concurrently in the evolving quantum state. Since the occurrence of any one of the possible outcomes is accompanied by the occurrence of each of the other possible outcomes, it is a problem to understand solely on the basis of the Schrodinger equation alone, how one of the possibilities can be, say, a billion times less likely to appear than some other one. The many worlds interpretation cannot explain why some outcomes are more probable than others. Since they are all supposed to be equally real, what does it mean to say one is more probable than another? Yet in experiments, we can know the different probabilities, and the many worlds interpretation fails to account for this. Maximilian Schlauhauser says, Various attempts have been made to find a consistent derivation of the Born probabilities in the explicit or implicit context of a relative state interpretation, but several arguments have been presented that show that these approaches fail. Adrian Ken highlights why many attempts fail in his paper One World vs. Many and rightly points out what this means. Everetti in quantum theory is essentially useless as a scientific theory, unless, for example, it can explain why we should expect to observe the Born rule to have been very well confirmed statistically. Evidently, Everettians cannot give an explanation that says that all observers in the multiverse will observe confirmation of the Born rule, or that very probably all observers will observe confirmation of the Born rule. On the contrary, many observers in the Everettian multiverse will definitely observe convincing disconfirmation of the Born rule. Nor can one look at the Everettian quantum theory and conclude that any given observer in the multiverse will probably observe confirmation. The theory has no notion of standard probabilities available to even make sense of such a claim. And if the theory doesn't explain the data, the data doesn't support the theory. There seems to be no good way around this, and if so, then that's the end of Everettian quantum theory as a serious contender. A theory with no predictive power should lose the scientific competition against theories that predict what we actually see. So it is senseless to say that one world is more probable than another, but that is what quantum theory actually predicts, and the many worlds interpretation can't account for this without collapsing to the many minds interpretation, as Kent highlights in his paper. So the next problem to highlight is the preferred basis problem. Basically, if the many worlds interpretation is true, then the wave function is evolving according to the Schrodinger equation, and must completely explain the entire universe by itself without the introduction of other processes to cause collapse, like in standard interpretations. But if this is the case, how do we arrive at the appearance of the classical world, like the one we live in? Henry Stapp explains this problem in his paper, and sums it up like this. The core basis problem is that the robust enduring states specified by environmental decoherence effects are essentially Gaussian wave packets that form continua of non-orthogonal states. But these eigenstates do not enjoy the locality and the quasi-classicality properties of the states defined by environmental decoherence effects, and hence are not satisfactory preferred basis states. The core problem needs to be addressed and resolved before a many worlds type interpretation can be said to exist. Okay, let me try to simplify what he means. Basically, the many worlds interpretation says that each eigenstate, or possibility in the wave function, becomes an actual distinct branch, or world just like ours. But the wave function is not a bunch of well-defined classical states sitting next to each other, so to speak. It is actually quite fuzzy, or messy, where these different possibilities blur together or overlap. 
They are not discrete orthogonal, meaning well-defined, states, but are wave packets that form a continuum of non-orthogonal states. This means that these different worlds, including ours, should be blurring together and overlapping. As Stapp says later in his paper, the essential point is that if the universe has been evolving since the Big Bang in accordance with the Schrodinger equation, that it must by now be an amorphous structure in which every device is a smeared out cloud of continuum of different possibilities. Indeed, the planet Earth would not have a well-defined location, nor would the rivers and oceans, nor the cities built on their banks. So if the many worlds interpretation is true, we should be observing a smeared out world, blurred together with others, not a discrete well-defined state, like what we actually live in. Everett, the original founder of the many worlds interpretation, never specified how the wave function was supposed to be defined as several discrete classical states. So the many worlds interpretation cannot account for why we live in a classical world. In idealistic views, like the orthodox interpretation, this is not a problem because there is a collapse mechanism. The essential role of the human participant or observer in the orthodox Copenhagen interpretation is to pick out a particular discrete subspace or a particular set of orthogonal subspaces from a continuum of logically possible alternatives. He is able to do this by not being part of the universe that evolves via the Schrodinger equation. Now I'd be lying if I didn't note that many world's advocates have tried to get around this problem. In fact, Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy says no one considers this as a problem anymore due to the research into decoherence theory and refers to a paper by David Wallace. Well, upon reading this back in April, I decided to contact Adrian Kent and see if it was true. And he replied that he didn't think Wallace had solved this problem or that anyone has and referred me to the second half of this paper where he points out why. Now, Wallace's basic argument is that many classical histories or worlds emerge from underlying quantum processes, which actually sounds very idealistic if the classical worlds are emergent. But he discounts a single collapse happening. Instead, all the possibilities go through decoherence into several classical worlds. As he puts it, if each decoherent history is an emergent structure within the underlying microphysics, and if the underlying microphysics doesn't do anything to prioritize one history over another, which it doesn't, then all the histories exist. Now, apart from seeming very idealistic, it is not really explained how these classical worlds just emerge from underlying quantum processes. Kent rightly calls out Wallace on this as a retreat to vagueness and hand-waving on points where precision is really required. It's hard to run a serious argument, pro or con, let alone prove a rigorous theorem, if one doesn't in the end know quite what one's talking about. How exactly does the wave function go through decoherence on its own if the many worlds interpretation specifically excludes extra processes from acting upon it to cause any changes. This is not really explained, and Kent points out various other problems as well. Among them, also noting that Zurich, who has been sympathetic to the many worlds interpretation, charges Wallace with circularity. The ontology is defined by applying the Born rule. Even if one could show, as Wallace claims, that agents defined within the ontology are rationally justified in using the Born rule as a calculus, for decisions, it would seem incorrect to portray the argument as a derivation of the Born rule within the Everettian quantum theory. Wallace's argument should rather be understood as attempting to show something weaker, that the Born rule re-emerges as output if assumed as input. The last objection I want to bring up is the fact that it lacks parsimony as the simplest explanation of reality. Now, Everettians like to claim it is the simplest explanation out there because it reduces the number of assumptions by removing the need for a collapse mechanism. But as we have just seen, this creates more problems than it solves. For the many worlds interpretation to become a competing scientific model, it needs to resolve these issues. But even if it could, it still has to face the implications that the observer's input does shape experimental outcomes, as the measurement problem and the coach inspector theorem suggest. So why postulate many worlds to explain the many choices we could have made and collapse to the many minds interpretation when it is far simpler just to posit we exist like we intuitively think and are able to just make choices? All idealistic interpretations say is that is what reality is, namely information and mind. Minds select one possibility to be actual from the only information reality we know to exist. All you need to accept is that we exist and there is one reality which are mathematical possibilities of what we could experience. Why posit these other possibilities are physically real existing worlds that we can never detect 
or know to exist, when it is far simpler just to say they exist as information in non-orthogonal states, which is how we know them to be in the mathematics. The orthodox idealistic interpretation is really just the philosophical conclusions of the standard Copenhagen interpretation, which was formulated to be the most practical way to handle the quantum world. Furthermore, the whole idealistic view can go beyond collapse and explain other elements of reality, which Brian Whitworth lists in his paper, The Physical World as a Virtual Reality. The many worlds interpretation is only employed to explain collapse, which creates more problems than it solves, and is incapable of explaining other areas of reality, unlike idealism. So if one holds to it, then they still have to make extra assumptions to explain these other aspects of reality, which idealism has no problem explaining since it is akin to Whitworth's virtual reality theory, which makes it far more parsimonious. So why wouldn't we pick a theory that explains much more with much less? So in conclusion, although the many worlds interpretation is an interesting hypothesis, I have to agree with opponents that it is not a competing model unless these problems are solved. Even at that, it is still less parsimonious than idealistic theories of reality. The many worlds interpretation seems interesting, but when you start to look at the details, you realize it has far more problems than meets the eye.